Welcome everyone to this online seminar for Work Together Stay Apart. Um, tonight we're going to show you a video uh, presented by Industry SMEs, um, filmed by CAA. This is the last of our public facing uh, component of the Work Together Stay Apart campaign. I'm Aaron Pierce. I've been with the CAA for about 16 months from industry, where I was an instructor and a CFI, and I've been on board helping CAA with the Work Together Stay Apart campaign. Carlton. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carlton Campbell, the South Island Aviation Safety Advisor. The other person that needs to introduce themselves is Keith. Now, we've done this presentation more than 30 times already and presented to over 1,500 pilots across the country. Keith's a busy guy, so he can't come to every single one of these, but he does have a video recorded for us. Kia ora and welcome to the Circuit Certainty Seminar. I'm Keith Manch, the Director of Civil Aviation. Thanks for attending the final set of seminars for the Work Together Stay Apart campaign. Over the last year and a half, the campaign has created great opportunities for us to engage with industry. I hope you found value in these engagements such as the plane talking and user series seminars. The Work Together Stay Apart campaign is a great example of the CAA becoming an intelligence-led, risk-based organisation. We've used intelligence to identify risks around airborne conflicts at unattended aerodromes. Following this, we've actively engaged and worked alongside industry to promote discussion about managing the risks associated with airborne conflicts. The statement of a commitment has been a big part of this campaign. It's gained over 240 signatories from individuals and organisations showing that this is an important issue for you and your peers. If we continue to focus on working together, even after the campaign ends, we will see ongoing improvements in safety. A key way to mitigate the risks of flying and operating at an unattended aerodrome is by following good aviation practice. The seminar you're about to hear discusses some of these important practices such as predictability, standard procedures, collaboration and working together. All of this is to ensure you have a consistent approach to operating in the circuit, aiming to keep everyone safe. I hope you enjoy the seminar and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues about how well it's gone. The question there, airmanship. What for you makes up airmanship? What are some of the elements of airmanship? Uh, many things, but, but good situational awareness in the first instance, perhaps. Absolutely. Situational awareness. Anything else? I'll throw Number a look shy. at him. I'll throw a look at him. Look out. There's more elements to it than that. All right, we'll um, give you an opportunity to unmask your shyness later on. We'll just park that at the moment. We've got two elements to airmanship being lookout and situational awareness. We'll talk a little bit later on this one. You can make sure your mics are muted now, please. It's always fun doing that online. Um, you're more than welcome to speak up when we do the interactive stuff like that. So for those that have been to other Work Together Stay Apart presentations, this slide will look familiar. Um, it's been one of the constants throughout the campaign. Last time it said, why are we talking about radio? This time it says, why are we talking about circuits? Um, for any instructors in the room, you may recognize the document in the top left uh, corner, the white one there. That was the 2020 Flight Training Safety Strategy. It came out and it kind of surprised us as instructors. Um, it told us that we were pretty average at teaching our students how to join at aerodromes. It told us we were pretty average at teaching navigation. We weren't very good at teaching our students to talk on the radio. And in fact, we were struggling to keep the aeroplanes on the runway. And it kind of hurt our feelings. But it did preempt the Work Together Star Park campaign in a way. Sadly, while that document was being written, um, the mass and accident happened. We had a mid-air. The circuit itself is a common factor in many of our occurrences, but also our fatal mid -airs, our last three being mastered in Pada Pada Umu and fielding. Online seminar feedback. 
told us that we needed to talk about the circuit, not about how to fly the circuit, but about the other considerations around it and that of other users. Industry feedback. We meet with the examiners of ASPEC, but also other examiners talk to CAA as well. The ASAs and myself, we still go out and fly, so do other staff in their daily roles. As those staff and examiners have been out flying and doing flight tests, they've also noticed that maybe the circuit work around the country isn't what it should be. Just as the standard overhead join and plain talking were meant as a reset of the standard, the video you're going to see tonight is exactly that as well. It's to put us all on the same playing field again. But as I said before, this is not a video about how to fly the circuit. We're not teaching you how to fly the circuit. That's the job of a flight instructor. We're a level up from that, and we're talking about the consideration of other users. Many of you may have filed 005s or ARCs, and in some cases possibly felt concerned that you haven't had the response that you might have expected from them. CAA last year had more than 10,500 of these reports, and this year are tracking to pretty much the same sort of number. Those get triaged on a weekly basis, and the majority of them fall into trend information that helps direct the CAA via that intelligence to any interventions or any actions that, that might help improve safety. We can click things. And in regards to the airborne conflict occurrences, in the last period of time since 2016, there's been 527 that have been actually reported. And you and I both know that the reported conflicts are not all of them. They're probably the tip of the iceberg because so much goes unreported. Within that, number, 142 of them have deemed to be major avoidance actions taken. And in those cases, instead of going into trend information, they uh, will engage or there will be engagement with CAA. Remembering that there's only a small team of less than 10 people that are responding to this 10,500 occurrences. The biggest concern is the critical area, subset of 80. Essentially, if you understand James Reason's model of the slices of holy cheese, and if it, all the holes line up, then we get to an accident. In these critical situations, this is when avoiding action has been taken and there's only one slice of cheese between the aircraft and the accident or the collision. So, as I said before, our last three mid-airs were mastered in Parapara Umu and fielding. All of those were investigated by TAKE. So TAKE is the Transport Accident Investigation Commission. They investigate any accident or incident of a nature that has a public interest. And it's, it's a bigger investigation than CAA generally. From those last three reports, um, there were some common factors that came out of them. For those of us that fly at unattended aerodromes, daily, this slide can be a little bit confronting because this could be any one of us on any day that we go flying. Apologies. We know that they were all at unattended aerodromes. That's why the Work Together Star Park campaign is purely focused on operations around unattended aerodromes. But the scary thing was that they were all on VMC days. These were blue sky days. Often as recreational flyers, we might look at the circuit or look at the area that we're flying in, pre-flight the aeroplane, not check the weather, and then just go flying. It was these kind of days that these three accidents happened. Two of the accidents were late in the morning, and one was mid-afternoon. We did look at the possibility of sunstrike, but the common factor here is that they had enough light to be able to see each other. The aircraft were all in different orientations, so it wasn't necessarily sunstrike. The basic fact is that they weren't fighting dawn, they weren't fighting dusk. There was enough light to see each other. Sadly, they all had elements of non-standard procedures. So this isn't a one-off. This isn't someone did something non-standard one day. One of these occurrences 
the locals had normalised a circuit direction that wasn't published, and eventually it was the non-standard behaviour that caught someone out. The reason we did the standard overhead join and we put so much focus on animations around vacating and joining throughout this campaign is all of the accidents had a joining element. Either one or both of the aircraft were in a join or had just completed the join. The other scary thing when you think about it is all of the aircraft were manoeuvring, so they weren't wings level in cruise. That's when an aircraft is generally easiest to fly. We've got the throttle set, we have the machine trimmed, and the visibility is quite good. At the time of impact in each of these accidents, every one of the machines was manoeuvring. It was pitching, banking, or both. That causes us a couple of issues. First one being, as soon as we manoeuvre a machine, and it doesn't matter whether it's a fixed wing, high or low, a rotary or a gyro, we cause blind spots. The other thing is that manoeuvring a machine until it becomes a muscle memory actually is a task in itself, and humans can't multitask. Lookout is also a task. So although we do our lookout, as soon as we start manoeuvring the machine, it becomes a task on its own, and some of our mental focus will come off the lookout. There's nothing that we can do about that. We need to be aware of it, though. The radio telephony or the radio work was called into question in each of those accidents as well. The one thing I can tell you is that the correct radio calls were made in each of them. But the only thing we can speculate is that was the listening watch going, or was there confusion about which aeroplane was talking? One of the accidents had two of the same aircraft type in the circuit, so it may be that one pilot spotted one aircraft thinking that radio call came from there, where it was actually the aircraft that he hadn't seen that was talking. This one really hits home for me. All of the aircraft and all of the pilots were at their home aerodromes. They were in their safe space. They didn't need the plate to know the elevation, know the frequency, know the runway or circuit direction. They knew these aerodromes off by heart. The other scary thing is that there was no protection in experience or license. We lost a microlight pilot, commercial pilot, PPLs, students. We even lost an examiner. In the last two years that we've run this Work Together campaign, there have been a number of touch points that uh, everyone can have with the campaign. In the actual face-to-face -face presentations, we've asked everybody what those touch points were that they personally had. If you have a look at the images there, there was a special vector that was put out exclusive to the Work Together Star Part. There's a statement of commitment Aaron's going to talk about, number of posters, and there's been engagements uh, with Facebook and other audio website uh, activities. And we've had three, if we could have the next click, please. We've had three videos, all of which are now, well, following tonight, will be online. First one being the standard overhead join reset, the plain talking video, and following tonight, the circuit certainty one. So there's a number of uh, points where people have been able to engage with the themes and the principles that have been uh, brought forward in the Work Together Star Park campaign. One that you won't uh, be familiar with there in the middle, there is a new gap booklet, How to Manage an Aerodrome. And that was uh, about to be published just before Christmas. Unfortunately, it might not be until just after at the moment because there's a, a small hiccup in the production of it. But uh, there are a number of points there that you can go back to the website and back to accessing the videos, which is particularly important when it comes to if you're an instructor and wanting to refresh things with maybe a student before they go on a cross country, or if you're a person that's been a bit uncurrent and wanting to uh, re-familiarise yourself with some of the principles. So they'll be available into the future throughout the uh, website. So a few of you may recognise this image. We're quite proud of this image. Um, this was our launch photo for the Statement of Commitment, as you've just heard Keith talk about and also Carlton just mentioned. In this image, we were best trying to represent the average user of an unattended aerodrome in New Zealand. And I want to acknowledge something. There's not a microlight in there for very good reason. 
What you can't see in that image is 35 knots of Canterbury Norwesterly directly across the runway. I'd hope as pilots we're all relatively clued up and good at physics, and if you have a look at that glider, there's something wrong with it. The physics don't make sense. On the left wingtip, the club treasurer that owns that glider is holding on for dear life, trying to stop their very expensive machine getting blown over, and if you look closely, the president's also sitting in the cockpit holding on to the controls. So in that image, we tried to represent scheduled IFR, rotary, rotary training, powered fixed wing, and gliding. We've skipped ahead, that's right. So the statement of commitment is almost a pledge, but not quite. It's showing your belief in the campaign and its messaging. The most powerful thing that we have as pilots to influence the behaviour of other pilots is one, how we behave ourselves. So this is doing the right thing, making the left turn on a left circuit, even when you think someone's not there, because it's the right thing to do. And that's culture. The other one that we've got is positive peer pressure, and that's what the statement of commitment is intended to be. So you can go to the CAA website and you can put your name on that document along with 81 organisations, and I'll show you how many privates as well in a moment. Um, and by collating a list of us that want to make our aerodrome safer, we can apply positive peer pressure to those that want to continue to do it the way they've always done it and put us at risk. And I'll make you a promise. If you put your name on that document, no one is going to turn up wearing that logo after you have a scare next week and say, but you signed this, because that's not what it's for. It's there to apply positive peer pressure to our fellow pilots. So on launch day, the National Carrier in New Zealand signed it, along with the Defence Force. And since then, we've also had Part 61 and 141 schools, both Microlite and GA. Maintenance providers, airport operators, and general aviation operators have all signed it as well. But more powerfully, and I apologise I haven't updated this number, but there's more than 200 individuals that have also signed it, showing their support for the campaign. So the video you're going to see tonight isn't scripted. It's not the CAA talking. I turned up with a videographer to our SMEs who you're going to meet in the video, and I just asked them questions and let them talk. Quite uncomfortable for them because it was on the fly, but this is your peers. There is no script. It's not CAA messaging. We were merely the conduit to allow industry to talk to industry. Now, we are dealing with technology, and we have managed to overload this before. So I will click play on the video. Give it a few seconds, and if it doesn't, click, uh, doesn't start playing for you, please do feel free to click the play button in the middle of the screen. If that fails or it comes out of sync, Ali's going to put a link in the chat to the YouTube video, and you can click there and watch it in its entirety. Do please come back after the video for the Q&A, and if you've got any questions as we go, type them into the chat, and we'll address them when we get to the Q&A. I hope you enjoy. In this gap video, we're going to be talking circuit etiquette. We've travelled the country talking to some of our industry's experts on how to make the circuit work for everyone. You're going to hear from helicopter, microlight and fixed wing pilots about their disciplines of flying and what they need you to know. This video is in a capsule and doesn't replace flight instruction, but it is meant as a reset of the standard, so we're all on the same page. The circuit is our means of controlling the flow pattern around the aerodrome to ensure that we've got predictable flow paths for our aircraft taking off and landing, departing and arriving, and allowing our pilots to practice circuits in a measured, safe way. The standard circuit is a left pattern consisting of five circuit legs. Upwind to at least 500 feet. Crosswind, where the aircraft climbs and a turn is made at 45 degrees to the threshold onto the downwind. The downwind leg is flown at 1,000 feet and parallel to the runway. 
base is turned at 45 degrees to the threshold, the aircraft is slowed and descended to no lower than 500 feet. And final, where the aircraft is flown to the landing point. Not all aerodromes uh, in the country fly the standard circuit procedure. Um, if there are variations, we can find this in the AIP Volume 4 underneath the relevant aerodrome chart. So some of these uh, circuit variations can include flying the downwind leg at a lower altitude or joining uh, the standard overhead join at a different altitude. Some aerodromes have a minimum approach speed uh, that is to be maintained. So it's really important to go and have a look in the AIP Volume 4 um, and make sure that you've done appropriate pre-flight planning before you head out. Now we understand the basic circuit pattern, we need to understand that there may be differences between users based on type. Aaron, Steve and Bevan will now tell us about the difference with helicopter, gliding and warbird circuits. When operating in a circuit anywhere, you need to have a good understanding of the different aircraft that are operating in that circuit. They all have different speeds, different climb angles, different approach angles, different approach speeds. So that is going to affect how the circuit is flown. Helicopter circuits are shorter, so they're closer into the airfield. They are slower, and the takeoff and particularly the approach are a lot steeper. Downwind, particularly, helicopter would only be 75 knots, maybe 80 maximum. Uh, on approach, uh, 60 is the standard, and crossing the threshold would be 30 knots, so we're very, very slow. Gliders do perform a reasonably standard circuit, and it's the 900, 500 foot, 300 foot circuit. But sometimes we do get caught out with wind, wave, sea breeze coming in and things like that. So um, we have to sometimes adjust our circuits because the whole thing's a very dynamic atmosphere. Uh, we could be coming downwind and we're only a thousand feet above the ground and if we run into 500 feet a minute uh, rate of descent uh, we've got uh, a minute or so before we can land. So we might be going halfway downwind, sinking at 500 feet a minute and we might have to turn base leg halfway down the airfield. Flying in the circuit with warbirds and vintage aeroplanes can be a bit of a challenge. So the circuit pattern in something like a tiger moth is often a little bit narrower than a standard Cessna or a, a um, general aviation aeroplane. Once we start stepping up into high performance aeroplanes like the Harvard, uh, where normally a reasonably standard circuit as we can bring the aeroplane back to about 110 knots or so in the downwind, um, but we do try and do a reasonably curved approach a long straight and final and any warbird is uh, not a great idea. Once the nose starts coming up you can't see the aeroplane in front of you or the runway. Microlight's a very generic term these days. Microlight can mean anything from a tube and fabric aircraft cruising at 50 knots to something cruising at 150 knots. The common factor with all of them is the slow stall speed and as we know we generally try and approach to land at about 1.3 times your configured stall speed, which can still be very slow for some microlights. The pilot of a traditional GA aircraft needs to ensure that they're going to give microlight pilots enough space, enough time uh, to fly their normal final approach at a speed probably much slower than you will be. All circuit activities are underpinned by four rules found in Part 91. They are use of aerodromes, operating on and in the vicinity of an aerodrome, operating near other aircraft, and the right-of-way rules. These four rules set up the predictability and flow of the traffic. I think it's really important that pilots conform to the four circuit rules because if you start doing things that are outside of the norm, you become unpredictable and then nobody can determine what you're going to do. Predictable circuits are essential for 
pilots, especially inexperienced pilots, to build a picture. And that starts with the direction of the circuit. It's published in the AIP. We must comply with it. That predictability in how we fly the circuit is what allows other pilots to know our intentions, where we're going to go, where we're going to be. If you don't conform, how else is everybody meant to know what you're going to be doing? All right, it's super important to be standard because then everybody knows what everybody else is doing. If we fly unusual shaped or sized circuits, it's going to add complexity and challenges to the other pilots who are trying to operate in the same airspace with us. Let's not make it more complicated than it has to be for the other players in our world. Speeds and circuit sizes may vary between aircraft types. Making sequencing work between various types is essential to avoid conflict. The first thing is to observe the other aircraft and make sure that you take a note of the uh, type, the speed, their trajectory, whether they're climbing or descending, and then put that together with your knowledge bank and try and figure out what they're going to do and how you're going to integrate with them. The other thing that we um, we need to look at as well with fixed wing is, you know, the closure rate, making sure that we give the helicopter enough space. It's very hard when you're in the downwind, particularly looking at an approaching aircraft on the same level, to be able to judge those closing speeds. So understanding that a helicopter flies slower than the fixed wing is, it goes a long way to uh, understanding how quickly you can close up on a machine. Both fixed wing and helicopter pilots need to be aware of the dangers of wake turbulence associated with helicopters. Fixed wing pilots should avoid landing or taking off in an area through which a helicopter has just hover taxied or an area from which a helicopter has just landed or taken off. Helicopter pilots need to exercise airmanship to avoid causing dangerous situations for other users who may not be familiar with the dangers of helicopter wake. So at unattended aerodromes, if you have uh, you know, aircraft in the circle with you and you're trying to increase the separation uh, between you and another aircraft, for example, if there's someone ahead of you and you're closing on them in the downwind, um, there might be a good example. You could extend your climb out, extend your crosswind or extend your downwind. Uh, if you're ahead of someone and you know that they're going to catch up to you, um, it might be a good opportunity for you to practice a glide approach um, or even a short approach to increase the spacing so you do a shorter circuit uh, and they can continue with their standard circuit. When building separation, it's the following aircraft's responsibility to allow the aircraft ahead enough space and time to complete their approach, climb out or landing. Extending a circuit leg or reducing speed on the downwind are the preferred methods of building the separation. Orbits should be avoided at unattended aerodromes because they can put an aircraft into head-on conflict with following traffic. Sequencing also affects ground traffic who must give way to traffic landing and taking off. The right-of-way rules apply throughout our operation of the aeroplane and specific right-of-way rules are published with regard to aeroplanes on the ground and aircraft coming into land. The landing aeroplane has right of way. I always like to see a lookout turn prior to lining up to build the situation awareness of any aircraft in the circuit or on base or final, just for absolute clarity. And a great way to do that is make sure that you park either on a 45 degree to the runway and have a good look or doing a clearing turn before you, you line up. It's your responsibility to spot any other traffic that are coming into land and you need to give way to them. We're very fortunate with helicopters that we are able to hover and carry out pedal turns. So my suggestion is prior to entering the taxiway and particularly the active runway, stop the helicopter short in the hover, do a full 360 degree pedal turn. Means that we can have a good look at the downwind, finals and the non-traffic side prior to entering the active runway. Sequencing can also be challenging when you need to practice circuit emergencies. Circuit emergencies such as glide approaches, auto rotations, flapless landings and simulated engine failures need to be practiced. 
However, when you're conducting them, you must not cause conflict. The main thing with the glide approach or the flapless approach is, you know, when you're uncontrolled, it's the consideration with the other traffic and the closure rate. When you do a glide approach, you're essentially going to be cutting off most of the, the base leg and the, the final. It's, it's more of a short approach rather than a normal approach. For example, if you're wanting to practice a glide approach, you'll want to make sure that there's no one coming in on final ahead of you when you decide to call the simulation. So auto rotations are a manoeuvre carried out by helicopters in the event of an engine failure. So they don't, helicopters don't glide like a fixed wing does. They need to fall out of the sky to spin the blades up. Um, and that's what reduces their rate of descent to allow them to get to the ground safely. What fixed wing pilots need to understand about auto rotations is they are initiated from generally a thousand feet AGL and just over the threshold of the runway. So we're very close in. The descent angle can be up to 75 degrees. All right, so we're coming down very steep and um, rates of descent on an average 1,800 to 2,000 feet a minute. And from the beginning of the auto rotation till the end, uh, we're looking at maybe 30 seconds start to finish. We don't want to cause congestion with other aircraft. We don't want to, them to have to avoid us when we're carrying out the emergencies. So. If it starts to get too busy, or you might even recognise that the pilots in the circuit don't understand what you're doing, that might be a time to take your emergencies somewhere else or another day. If we're teaching low level circuits, sometimes it's simulating low cloud base, uh, poor weather. It's required so that the aeroplane can be flying slowly, close to the aerodrome, so that uh, the pilot keeps sight of the aerodrome and where they want to land. But when you are flying a low level circuit, it's important to think about your positioning uh, in terms of other traffic. They're not gonna necessarily know where to look uh, unless you advise them that you're in the low level circuit. When an instructor is teaching the bad weather circuit or when a pilot decides to use the bad weather circuit, they need to be aware that they're going away from the standard. If there's other circuit traffic flying a standard circuit, they must integrate with that so the other circuit traffic has priority. Many reported airborne conflict events occur during the vacating or joining of the circuit. When vacating and joining the circuit, good decision-making supported by a robust situational awareness and standard predictable procedures are key. To vacate the circuit, we can make use of any of our circuit legs, be it upwind, crosswind, downwind or base. Announce your intentions as part of your departure call and if you're making a downwind call again announce your intentions. You don't want somebody following you in the downwind waiting for you to turn base if you're continuing to truck out of the downwind to vacate the circuit. If an aircraft is coming in to join at an aerodrome, whether it's via the standard overhead join or directly onto one of the circuit legs, it's important to make sure you've maintained um, a good lookout and you've spotted the other traffic that already exists in the circuit. In terms of joining at an unattended aerodrome, the default standard would be the standard overhead join. Uh, but if you're happy with the conditions and you know, you know what the field's like and what runway's in use, you can join direct downwind base or final. Before doing a direct join, make sure that the timing is going to work between you and other existing circuit traffic. Make sure you're not going to cut anyone off. Make sure that no one will have to change what they're doing to fit you in. Essentially, in terms of joining direct downwind base or final, the aircraft that are already established in the circuit will have the right of way over the aircraft that are joining. Although powered fixed wing aircraft must join overhead or directly onto a circuit leg, pilots need to be aware there are also allowances for helicopters and gliders. The rules allow for a helicopter to join non-standard in a circuit. That is anywhere that is not downwind, base, finals or overhead. If we are joining non-standard, we need to make sure that we communicate that clearly to anyone else that's operating in the circuit. But the important thing for a helicopter pilot is that we need to make sure that we 
uh, don't cause conflict with any other traffic that's in the circuit. Sometimes we may not be able to get over onto the AIP published circuit of the airfield. We may have to do a non-standard circuit on the other side rather than cross over, get low and perform a very low, low turn. The skydive plane descends really, really quickly, about 5,000 feet a minute. It's really important that when we're descending, we descend away from the circuit so that we're away from traffic. It's equally as important to join the, tra join the circuit in a standard way. So once we've completed the descent at that high descent rate, we slow the aircraft down and we join the circuit in a normal way. It's really, really important that we don't come into the circuit in a way that compromises the other traffic already in the circuit. It's absolutely not okay to come screaming into the circuit from uh, the top. When a pilot is deciding on a joining method, it's important they consider other factors and airspace users. Sometimes the standard overhead join may create conflict with existing users or operations. The overhead join should be avoided when the skydiving happening, gliders being winched, those types of activities. Also when the uh, cloud base is too low for an overhead join, I think it's important that all joining methods are practiced and pilots are current in them and they understand them. The pilot then has a, has a good big toolbox of joining procedures that can be used for um, all the different scenarios that um, he or she may face. Agricultural aircraft engaged in agricultural work off the aerodrome may also operate without conforming to the published circuit or the active runway. However, they must not cause conflict to other users. At unattended aerodromes without the help of a control tower to control the flow and separation of traffic, the responsibility is on all pilots to sequence and avoid conflict. Airborne conflict generally occurs in the circuit when one or both pilots have an ineffective lookout which leads to the loss of situational awareness. Pilots may even be aware of a developing conflict or know another aircraft is close to them but do not have them in sight. Look, if you don't have anybody in sight in the circuit and you know that they're there particularly, then remove yourself from that situation. When you're in the circuit and you feel there may be a potential for conflict and you can't spot the other traffic, it's important to communicate and if that doesn't work, maintain wings level and vacate. Have a good look round and then vacate. You know, whether it's a go round or you just clear the circuit area, um, then that's what you need to do. Get out of a circuit, take stock, get clear, and then come back and join. All right, and don't rejoin the circuit until you've got everybody in sight. Clear the circuit area, carry out a standard overhead rejoin, reassess where everybody is, and then integrate into the circuit. If something happens in the circuit, there's no need to get upset. Things happen. Sometimes we do get cut off. People make mistakes. At that point, deconflict, remain cool, communicate if you have to, and once the conflict is resolved, continue with what you were doing. The radio in the middle of a busy circuit environment is not a time to start chastising people. Fly the aeroplane first and be courteous about letting other people fly their aeroplanes. Conflict can occur when differing types of aviation mix within the uncontrolled circuit, such as VFR, IFR, gliding and parachuting. Having a basic understanding of each other can vastly reduce this conflict from occurring. An IFR approach is an imaginary road that brings us to a place um, safely, um, avoiding the terrain, so we can hopefully break visual and then continue the approach to land. I think in the most simple terms, it's just that. Um, we follow imaginary lines in the sky and our equipment is telling us where these lines are. We don't have the flexibility of movement. I think that's probably the biggest one. You feel like you can have everything under control. You're ahead of the aircraft procedurally. You know what's going on. You're in a good place. And then it all starts. You're in the descent you're on your way to maybe a hold or to start the approach and then typically now someone gets airborne, someone taxis out and you've got to manage and deal with, okay, I've now got circuit traffic joining the party and it becomes uh, yeah, 
quite a high workload very quickly. So IFR is like another language to the typical GA pilot. If you're flying an IFR aircraft and you're coming into an uncontrolled airfield, particularly on a day where there's lots of VFR pilots flying, remember they don't have the same maps and charts that you have. For IFR traffic that are coming and going from unattended aerodromes, it may be helpful to include a VFR reporting point um, along with the IFR reporting points so that our student pilots or our recreational pilots in the area have a much better understanding of where this IFR traffic is and how we can all sequence in together. For me, you know, comms is a big one. We've all got our rules. We hopefully all know our rules and how we're going to operate. But if we can communicate clearly to each other, um, then it's just so much simpler, so much easier. A good radio call, a clear radio call, concise, well formatted, delivered, just is a game changer for any pilot. I know clearly where that person is, what their intentions are and how they're going to manage themselves. And they seem to understand what I'm doing. When an IFR aircraft breaks visual and is visually manoeuvring around the airfield for the most suitable runway, then it absolutely has to apply to the usual rules of separation and sequencing. Um, it can't get its elbows out and bully people around, you know. The, um, our job is to sequence in safely and efficiently with other VFR. I would encourage anyone that operates out of an aerodrome that has IFR traffic as well to go out and get familiar with the IFR procedures in your area. Whether you want to talk to an IFR pilot that's local to the airfield or go to your local aero club and ask one of the instructors, they'll help you out. We've all got our rules, we hopefully all know our rules and how we're going to operate, but if we can communicate clearly to each other, then it's just so much simpler, so much easier. The AIP tells us that IFR must integrate with other traffic. However, in certain meteorological conditions, it may need VFR traffic to give priority to the IFR. For example, if the aerodrome is overcast, then the joining IFR traffic cannot visually separate or sequence. In this situation, it would be best practice, once the IFR traffic is established on three to five mile final, for VFR circuit traffic to either land and wait or extend a circuit leg remaining clear of the approach and overshoot for the IFR traffic's runway. This allows the IFR traffic to safely break visual and complete their approach. Winch launching of gliders is relatively common in New Zealand. Mike is going to talk us through a winch launch so we know what to expect when we encounter one while we're out flying. A standard winch launch in New Zealand usually goes somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 feet above the ground. And starting on the ground, the launch point controller, about two minutes before the glider takes off, will put out an aerial call to advise all traffic in the area that a winch launch will be taking place to approximately two to 3,000 feet above the airstrip. When the glider pilot is ready to go, the cable is connected onto the bottom of the glider and then the wings are levelled. The person who's running the wingtip checks that there is no traffic and checks all clear above and behind. The launch point controller then signals to the winch to take up slack. That's where they take the slackness out in the rope until the rope is very tight. And once the rope is very tight, then the signal is given and the glider will go from 0 to 60 knots in about one to two seconds and start climbing at about 45 degrees and it will take about one minute to reach two to 3,000 feet. It can be challenging for powered pilots working in the circuit with a glider. Mike offers us some advice. Most gliders fly the circuit somewhere between 50 and 60 knots. Your average Cessna would be flying at about 90 knots, so there's a very real problem of overtaking in the circuit. The best thing to do when you're joining a circuit with another glider is to stay outside of the glider and give it a bit of space because the glider is, has to land. And if you just fly outside us, you'll be able to see us, extend downwind and then follow us in when we land. Once you've landed in your powered aircraft, it's really important that you clear the runway as soon as possible because the glider behind you has no choice to land and will be following you in. If you're going to fly into a gliding site and you're not used to flying into a gliding site, the first thing you need to do is consult your charts and then consult the AIP. 
The AIP is very good with all the information that you need to know about it, especially if it's a winch site, it'll tell you where the cables are and it'll tell you the height that we're winching to. And if you're not sure about, still not sure about that, then give them a call. Just as with IFR traffic and gliding operations, pilots need to be aware of how and where parachutes and skydive aircraft will operate around unattended aerodromes to avoid conflicting with their operation. Stu tells us more. If you're going to an aerodrome that has parachuting activities happening at the aerodrome, it will be promulgated in the AIP and there will be parachute symbols on the chart and there will be a phone number for the operator. So it's really important to do your prep before you go into that airfield. It's really important to understand that the parachutes are not necessarily always right over top of the airfield. The parachute aircraft runs in towards the direction of the wind and if it's really windy upstairs, they might drop the parachutes actually, or the parachute is actually as far as a mile away from the airport. Um, that means that they can be opening between 5,000 feet and 3,000 feet anywhere a mile around the airport. So it's not just directly overhead the airport. So the normal process for a skydive pilot is after they take off to get whatever clearances they need to make the climb to whatever altitude they're going, then that pilot will make a two minute call prior to dropping the parachutists overhead the airfield. So at that two minute call, we consider the, the parachute drop area to be live. If a pilot is entering an area and hears that two minute call, um, the best thing to do is just stay away until the, uh, the parachute pilot then calls jumpers away. Normally takes about somewhere between five to six minutes from the time the parachute opens till the time they're on the ground. So giving yourself a five minute window is a good, is, gives yourself a good safety margin. Situational awareness is an essential skill for all pilots and is the key to good airmanship. It's really about building up a mental picture of what's happening around you, the airfield, and understanding the movements of the traffic. Our situational awareness as we approach, join and operate within the aerodrome circuit pattern is vital. And it's not just a snapshot of now. We can build that through listening for the radio calls of the other aircraft operating and plotting in our heads where they are now. That's fine. I call it three-dimensional aerial chess, to plot where those aircraft are going to be and how they're going to potentially conflict you in the circuit. Develop your mental map, understand what other aircraft are doing, um, and then that's going to develop the skill set which is going to aid your situational awareness, you know, building the mental picture. It's important to start building the bigger picture of what's happening from the moment you arrive at the aerodrome. As you're pre-flighting, as you're taxiing out towards the runway, you can start building your situational awareness when you're walking out to the aircraft by actually looking around and seeing who's in the circuit. You know, you can hear the aircraft, you can see the aircraft probably a lot more clearly, and that's a great way to start prior to the flight. It's important to maintain your lookouts and maintain listening watch so you are always aware of what that bigger picture is. ADSB technology allows aircraft to broadcast and receive position and altitude information from each other, helping pilots in building their mental picture. Well, ADSB is a great tool for sure, um, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, it gives you the big picture, but it doesn't necessarily give you the whole picture. Uh, there's a lot of time spent with people with these new screens, and these new technology. Uh, they are looking inside at their screen and they pipe up on the radio and say, I've got you on the ADSB. I'd much prefer you rather than looking at your screen, just stick your eyes outside your windscreen and have a look for me rather than uh, telling me that you've got you on your screen. ADSB is a great tool, but most gliders in this country don't have ADSB fitted. I would estimate approximately 20% of the gliders in this country have it, so you're not going to see us. You need to be looking out of the window. Some World War I aeroplanes or vintage aeroplanes do not have ADSB, generally because they don't have an electrical system at all. It's a great help to pilots, but it doesn't replace the Mark I eyeball, all right? Too many times um, I hear about people saying, I haven't got you on TCAS, or, you know, is your transponder working? And you're sharing a circuit with someone. 
you know, you should already know that they are there and you should know their relative position in the circuit without having to uh, refer to any of the aids that have been built into the cockpit. We build our situational awareness or our moving map using our listening watch, lookout and other aids. We can then use our situational awareness to guide our airmanship and decision making. Part of our ability to fly the circuit safely rests on our airmanship. Airmanship relates to the rules of the road and how we behave amongst our fellow flyers. We want to make sure that we fly predictably, consistently and safely at all times. Airmanship is it's a way of being. It's a way of being considerate to other pilots that are in the air, much as you would do if you were playing sports. Yeah, airmanship to me is just treating each other with respect and combining our knowledge, our skills and our experience so that we can all integrate together and get home safe. So airmanship in the circuit is um, really important in my eyes. It's been predictable in terms of what you're doing being courteous to others and thinking about the overall picture uh, of what's going on around you. Just as airmanship is vital for a safe operation in the air, bringing that airmanship and communication along with constructive relationships back onto the ground is vital for an aerodrome safety culture. Another way to improve the operating environment around the airport is to be engaged with the airport. I think working together with everybody at the aerodrome makes a big difference to the safety at the aerodrome. So it's important to have good relationships with other operators and other airfield users so that you can create a really healthy environment on your airfield. This makes it much easier for everyone just to work together um, when you're in the circuit. Engaging with the other operators, and especially if there is a forum available through a user group meeting, established either by pilots for pilots or by the airport company, which is even better because it brings the ones operating the airfield to the same table. I'm a great believer of common sense and communication. On a busy airfield like this, it's really important that the operators and the users and the participants at the airfield get together and talk to each other and understand what each other is doing. By doing that, what we do is we get, we get a better picture of how things are going to operate and we can solve problems before they arise. I think it's really, really important that we continually work together and if we do have an issue, instead of storming across there and getting grumpy, just go and have a chat. We've built a really good relationship with the, with the flying club and, um, and the door goes both ways. So the Aero Club comes and sees us and we can go and see them to try and sort out any issues before they become issues. We hope you found this video useful. As you would have noticed, all of our experts have talked around standard procedures, predictability and lookout. Feel free to talk to your flight instructor if you have any questions or reach out to us through the website. Remember, fly friendly. Feel free to unmute uh, at this point in time. When we asked this question prior to the video, we got two answers, lockout and situational awareness. On the basis of both of the videos you've just watched, what other elements would you put into airmanship now? Flying courteously, um, consideration. And very important. Courtesy and consideration, absolutely. Common sense. Common sense. Predictability. Was that predictability, was it? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Standard procedures. Standard procedures, definitely. Communication. Communication, very important. Planning. Planning. 
Yeah. Does make uh, make a difference to the airmanship, doesn't it? Okay, let's, uh, thanks for those. Let's see uh, what our comments are on this. Apologies if you can hear some fireworks going off in the background. I'm surrounded by young families and obviously they're letting them off before the kids go to bed. So um, hopefully it's not too loud. So we sat down and spoke with some of our SMEs and we spoke to a lot of the examiners. And one of the things really common with the examiners is that it's an easy flight test pass if the person's got good situational awareness. And when you think about it, we've all flown with other pilots and sometimes the safest pilot, the one that you're most comfortable flying with, isn't the one that can fly the aircraft most accurately. It's the one that's built a really good situational awareness. And they've worked really hard at sticking to the percentage procedures. And by doing this, it gives them that predictability to other pilots. The other thing that they've worked really hard on isn't necessarily how well they physically fly the aeroplane, because few of us are naturally gifted pilots. We all have to work hard on that. But what makes them even better is they've spent a lot of time developing their situational awareness. They've spent a lot of time developing their lookout, and they've learned how to integrate the technology, both ADS-B and radio, into helping them build on their situational awareness. Too often do we see it that, especially in recreational flying, we get ourselves an iPad and we connect it to ADS-B. And rather than use it to enhance our situational awareness, it becomes a crutch. And we let down our lookout, we let down our listening watch. These really good pilots actually use it to build on even further. By building that situational awareness, that gives them the ability to have really good decision making. And quite often it would look conservative, but it's safe. And then last year, if you were engaged in the campaign, we all heard Carlton saying, yield, don't push. And this is empowering ourselves, and for those of us that teach, empowering our students, that if we're not sure of what's in the flight path of the, of the aircraft, or we're not sure what's going on at the aerodrome, and actually just hanging back, not continuing to push forward, either reducing the speed of the machine or orbiting and staying away from the airfield before we join, giving us time to build that situational awareness. If we all went out and did this, we achieved the ultimate goal. And it's actually not written into law. We can't. And it doesn't matter whether it's a student with an instructor, an instructor with a student, whether it's those students that go on to fly ATRs or jets, or whether it's a recreational pilot taking their friend for a fly on the weekend, we all share the one common goal. Everyone goes home safe. Because we're not looking face to face, I'll ask this as a rhetorical question. If any of you know who this gentleman is. If, whoops, sorry. Um, yeah, asking the rhetorical question if you've seen this gentleman. You've probably seen him more in the next image, this one here. He's Captain Brian Davies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Captain Brian Dunn who uh, recently passed away, unfortunately, after holding a class one medical well into his 80s. He was an airline inspector and worked in the airline group in CAA. He had a mantra. Each time he went flying. Next slide, please. Each time he went flying, he would make a contract with himself. He would say, today I'm going to fly safely. And the next time he went up, he'd make the same agreement with himself. At the end of Brian's career, he had another very proud statement that he would make, which essentially said that for every land, sorry, for every takeoff that he had, he had an equivalent landing. So he never had an accident in his 80 years and many tens of thousands of hours of flying. So our message from this is if we can take a little bit of Brian's mantra, we can take some of the principles that we've seen in this slide, oh, sorry, in this 
video, the airmanship principles that have been elaborated on, and as a consequence, work together to ensure that we stay apart and everyone comes home safely. Feel free now to unmute and pose any questions that you would like to uh, raise at this point in time. Even if it doesn't relate to this specific video, but relates to any aspect of the Work Together Star Park campaign, we're more than happy to uh, try and provide an answer. Yeah, just interested in your comments on um, low performance micro lux and gyros um, flying close and low level. The limit is possibly only 40 knots or so, and uh, need to sequence so with other aircraft on flying with it. So, any issues with that when doing a long level circuit? A little bit difficult to pick up some of what you're saying, but if I've heard it correctly, you're asking about microlites and gyros that are flying a bit slower. Uh, two points there. Any aircraft that is slower, a faster aircraft in the circuit should take a wider spacing because within the circuit, there shouldn't be any passing. So if you think about it, a, a gyro or a microlite might be quite close into the field, as you've acknowledged. A GA training aircraft might be a bit further out. A, a twin or a warbird might be further out again. And quite clearly, if you've got a Q300 coming in, their circuit will quite be quite a bit wider. The standard uh, average circuit is around about six minutes. So performance uh, in order to be a six minute circuit or thereabouts means that the faster aircraft go wider to avoid that passing, to avoid that conflict. In relation to the 500 foot point, the 500 circuit is not the standard. The standard is the thousand feet or whatever the AIP promulgates, given there might be some airspace above. And so if an aircraft chooses to do a 500 foot circuit, they need to ensure that they are not creating the conflict for other traffic. Generally, what we would advise from the CAA point of view is that, yes, a 500-foot circuit should be trained, particularly in a dual situation, in the circumstances of uh, being prepared for if there is weather that confines your altitude somewhat. But to just do a 500-foot circuit because you can it's not prudent on a busy day. It's more appropriate to a day when you're not going to create conflict and disturb other users in the circuit conforming to the standard. Does that help, Stuart? Oh, you're muted there. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. Um, Carlton touched on it with the six minute circuit. So you think back to the low performance micro lights like the Bantams and the Pterodactyls. The last thing we actually want is them up in the 1,000-foot circuit because then it's going to cause issues. So it's entirely appropriate for them to be flying their six-minute circuit a little bit lower, a little bit closer, and then it helps separate us by time as well as altitude and space. Yeah, the Associated well, with that right. question is another point. You heard in the presentation there Nathan mentioning when the weather prevents us from doing a standard overhead join. A little bit difficult to have the engagement here uh, using this technology, so I'll just explain it. What happens if cloud base prevents one conducting an overhead join? Some people have answered, well, they'll just join on a downwind base or final. But what's the purpose of an overhead join? It's to ascertain the wind direction, the runway in use, surface conditions, and the traffic. And if the cloud base is lower and you just barge in on one of those circuits, you might not have all that information. And so therefore you might be intruding and creating conflict with somebody else. So the same is with the standard overhead join. We approach the airfield with the airfield on our left, but outside the two mile standard of the GA circuit. So that you then go around, fly around outside the circuit pattern at whatever height you are under the cloud base, 
looking in to be able to spot, because two miles you should be able to spot the windsock. You certainly should be able to spot traffic at the same altitude to then having ascertained those three elements join on whatever is the appropriate leg. If you're Possibly, not comfortable, oh, sorry, sorry Aaron, go ahead. No, no you're okay. Uh, possibly another element that uh, Stuart's question has posed as well is the fact that the four rules that were mentioned and the presenter and several of the, sorry, the uh, um, commentator and the presenters all have one common element. Whenever we're in a uh, bit of airspace where there is other traffic and particularly joining and departing from an unattended aerodrome, there is one fundamental responsibility we have. And that's one of the rules which states avoid the hazard of collision. It doesn't just say avoid collision, but it says avoid the hazard of collision. That theme is replicated through the other three rules in the AIP and was very much part of the messaging about the airmanship factor there. So if we are trying to avoid that conflict, that principle of yield don't push, then the stress of a lot of these airborne conflicts uh, reduces and is, is actually removed. Too many of us have sort of considered the fourth rule there, which is, well, I had right of way. Uh, the right of way must be considered in conjunction with avoiding the creation of hazard of conflict. Any questions in the chat there, Ellie? I, I just want to say um, uh, thank you very much for a very informative uh, video and the uh, and the people participated in it. And uh, thanks to Cotton Campbell and Aaron Pierce for taking the time to discuss it with all the pilots in New Zealand. Um, one of the things which bothers me continuously is the accent that people communicate. Um, some of them just, to me, it sounds gibberish. Uh, yep. So I ask them to repeat, and they do. Um, so, you know, communication is the key to, uh, is one of the key to stay clear of accidents and uh, creating hazards at the airport. Totally agree. Uh, one of the things we have encouraged as we've gone around the country is reminding Kiwis that if you're a, a natural born Kiwi, um, we generally speak very quickly. <laughs> Um, so encouraging people to slow down their rate of speech and especially instructors because they've probably made the same radio call three or four times that day and it becomes automated. Um, but that doesn't set a good example or help the other airspace users either. So we have been pushing that message as well. But equally in conjunction to that, we've been having to remind people that Nordo is still a legitimate activity in unattended airspace. And so therefore, in conducting an overhead join, uh, you could be in the joining procedure with a Nordo aircraft operating quite legitimately. So uh, don't expect every aircraft necessarily to be making a call because they may not be able to. Maybe a failure or it may be that they're an aircraft, as uh, Bevan said in the Warbird situation, where they don't have an electrical system, so they might not have a radio. There are no questions in the chat, Aaron. There's a comment from Stuart. Um, arrive high, depart low helps with jo join and departure. Comments yep. on close and low level aircraft, but I think that's the question that was already addressed. So Yeah, I, I'll address the first one, the arrive high, join low. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> arrive high, vacate low. Yes, brilliant saying. Um, one of the things that we do need to keep in mind is as a whole, yes, that's perfect. But there's an old set heading method, which is climb and turn over the aerodrome to go out on heading. So we do need to keep in mind that people can still do that. And saying that, the advice is, is if someone is joining, then vacate low. The joining aircraft really out of airmanship, give them the overhead and we can go out 
get clear of the circuit and then climb. And that's particularly important in a departure if you have an aircraft that is conducting an over air join, they're crossing the upwind threshold at a thousand feet to join downwind. Any high performance aircraft should leave that thousand foot bit of airspace for that aircraft coming from the non traffic side and ensure that they don't climb out in a max performance situation that puts them straight into conflict with that aircraft coming from the uh, non-traffic side. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much everyone for attending tonight. It is really appreciated. Um, we do have a couple more uh, in-person events, Kaikoura and uh, actually Kaikoura is the last public one. Um, so if you're in that area, you're more than welcome to come along with that or send your friends if you think they should see this as well. Um, on the screen there, there is a, a email address. If you've got any feedback or questions, you're more than welcome to flick us an email there or our personal emails are quite easy. It's our first name dot last name at caa.govt.nz. Again, thank you very much for attending. Um, this is the last of the public facing part of the campaign. So it's now over to you, it's over to industry to continue working together to stay apart. Thank you, everyone. Good night.